All right, everybody, we have spent a lot of time recently talking about all these different varieties of chords and ways that we can use sort of the harmony that we have, the notes that are in the chord. Let's sort of let's see if we can take a step in a different direction here and think about what happens if we want to use some notes that are not in the chord, right? That would be a nice change of pace. So let's get in there. Um, first, we're going to sort of talk a little bit about why in the world you would want to do that, though my question would be why wouldn't you want to do that? So the topic that we're really looking at here, the technical term is, is we're talking about what's called non-harmonic tones. These are notes that are not in the harmony. You, you'll sometimes hear these called non-chord tones. I tend to call them non-harmonic tones, and you'll see me uh, abbreviate it as NHT, non-harmonic tones. Um, these are notes that are not in the chord, and really the, the thing that we're looking at here is that we're adding some dissonance to our to our harmony. Now we've sort of talked about dissonance and we've been sort of skirting around it a little bit and we've said, well, we can consider like a six four chord to be dissonant because it, it contains that fourth interval above the bass which needs to needs to resolve. That's dissonance on a slightly different level. That's like harmonic dissonance chords that are tense that need to resolve to other chords. Um, here, we're really looking at specific, very local dissonances that are present when there are notes that don't match the rest of the chord. And that's wonderful. I mean, we really want to add this kind of interest to the music. We're, we're connecting to that general, you know, always something that we talk about in music, this idea of tension and release, um, the idea that you don't want something that's a little too perfect, right? That works a little too well. It's a, it's actually kind of funny that when we hear chord progressions, when we hear music that only uses notes that are in the chord, it doesn't really do the same kind of sort of emotional work for us. We really like there to be that sort of, not grittiness necessarily, but an element of a note that doesn't belong, that really works. And so we want to develop a system for incorporating these sounds in these notes that don't really that don't really work with the chord but that we can still include and that have such a powerful expressive uh, element to them um, non-harmonic tones come in all shapes and sizes we're really just going to focus on two of them and these are by far the most straightforward two but also they are the foundation of such a huge part of um, music, the way we conceive of how to put music together. And one of these in particular, uh, should the idea that we're describing should sound very familiar, and, and the other is a very important musical idea. So before we get into these two types, let's just quickly look at why would we want, why would we want to add them? What, what are they going to, what are they going to do for us? And I want to do that by looking at a couple melodies here that I have taken the non-harmonic notes out of. So I've sort of stripped these down into their more boring uh, sort of bare bones here. So if we just look at this melody. I would say that's about as far from a classic melody as we can think of. They're really, we're sort of missing a lot there. But if we, if we actually sort of look at what's going on here and add in a couple of these notes, Right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Mozart. I mean, he, the way he's glaring at me, that's okay. I think he glared at everyone that way. But we can sort of hear that adding this E flat, right? You can hear that it doesn't belong, right? That's so much more interesting than just. Right? What is that? That's nothing. We want that. And even here. See? It doesn't fit. Right? We really like that added uh, tension, added dissonance that these notes bring. Let's look at another one here. Even more of a stark melody. What do we got this one? Does that sound like anything? 
kind of very, very little information to go on there. What if I sort of use, what if I used this sound? And what if I played this at the beginning? What if I did that and eventually got to... What if we did a little bit of that? All right, a little MJ for us here. Right, we can hear how this bare bones melody is a lot more interesting with some other notes around it. Right, we can sort of hear how those notes that snake around, right, especially it starts on this beautiful suspended chord. That A, that, oops. Right, that's just so lovely. Right, lovely, lovely. All right, let's do one more. Another very, very, very empty melody. I mean, what is this? This is nothing. This one's such a great example because we can see that by just, we're just going to actually add one tiny little 16th note in a couple places here, and we've got this nothing kind of gesture that quickly turns into a classic. Here are that C. Adds a lot. I mean, this is from Miles Davis' classic uh, where we've got that beautiful kind of thing. Right? And it goes into this lovely, lovely stuff. Right? So we've got this all blues melody. So I hope you can hear that not only do they immediately add a lot of musical interest, but we actually don't have to do a lot. We don't have to add a lot of non-harmonic tone material to take a very, very boring phrase, turn it much more interesting. So uh, let's look at two specific things here. But first, let's get some characteristics down. So one of the things that we really use to distinguish by when we get to these two, how do we sort of tell them apart? How do we tell any non-harmonic tones apart? Is we look a lot at what's called the preparation and the resolution. The preparation is how we approach the non-harmonic tone, and the resolution is how we leave the non-harmonic tone. So we really end up with sort of having this pattern of three notes, right? There's the note that comes before it, there's the non-harmonic tone, the tone that is not in the chord, and then there's the note after it, the resolution. So we saw some, some of these sort of three chord patterns in our 6-4 chord things. This is just another extension of that where we look for these units, these musical units. These are three notes, right? Preparation, the non-harmonic tone, and the resolution. Um, how do we get there and how do we leave? Um, and when we think about preparation and resolution, we're, we're talking about all kinds of ways that we can describe the motion, but nothing very complicated. So we could uh, describe the direction that they go, the distance that they move, things like that. Um, there's really not a ton to this, but I hope you can see that quickly by just sort of even just taking direction and distance, direction and interval, there's a lot of differences that we can come up. We could think of direction up or down combined with intervals stepwise. Maybe it's a jump, maybe it's a skip. Does it skip up and then move downwards by step? Does it move completely stepwise, always in the same direction, right? There's a lot of different um, combinations of these things that we could come up with. And the two that we're going to focus on are what's called the passing tone and the neighbor tone. And these, like I said, are really, really central to so much of the way of we think of the way that we think about music. Um, passing should be reminiscent of the passing 6-4 chord. So we've already have we already have two applications of this idea of passing in music. Um, and we have these uh, abbreviations for these, PT being passing tone, NT being neighbor tone, that we're going to use as we analyze and as we think about these chords. So let's look first at the passing tone. We've, we've looked at, as I said, passing motion before, and we saw that things that are passing in music fill in the space of a third, right? Our passing 6-4 chord, right? In the bass between 
the space of a third. And that's what we're going to see here with a passing tone as well. So if we, if we can find a gap of a third, we can put a passing tone in between it. So let's look here. We've, we're in C major. We're in the people's key here. We're going from a one chord to a two chord. Sounds great. Nothing really remarkable. Do any of the voices here have a third that you can see? Not the soprano. They go from G to F. The tenors, or sorry, the altos go from E to D. And the basses go from C to D. But the tenors go from C to A. But that's a third. And so we could fill that third in with a passing tone. So instead of just going from C to A, we could have a passing tone. The B is passing between the C and the A. So the C becomes the preparation, A becomes the resolution, and instead of this, right, where everybody's moving together, we end up with this. And I hope you can hear when the B is introduced, we get a little bit of dissonance, right? But that's not in the chord. It's a lot more interesting. So just by adding this one note in there, we have a much more interesting musical texture. Now, the really important thing here is not to say, well, we should just start adding notes like crazy because apparently notes that aren't in the chord sound good. What sounds good for our ears generally, or what we tend to like, are notes that don't belong, but we can hear where they're going. That's what's really nice about the passing tone, is that it has such clear motion. Our ear, in that moment, can tell where that dissonance is going to resolve to, right? Um, and so the way we could define the passing tone to differentiate it from other non-harmonic tones is that it's completely stepwise in the same direction, right? So all three of the notes here, they're moving downwards, and it's stepwise. A passing tone cannot be anything that involves a skip or a jump of any kind. It, it is completely stepwise. That is what makes it a passing tone because, again, it's connected to that idea that we want to be able to hear where it's heading. Right? If I do this passing tone, if I'm the tenors, and I'm going to sing that, that doesn't really sort of make a lot of sense. Or let's say I could jump to another note in the D chord here. Yeah, I could jump down to F. But when you're hanging out on B there, your ear isn't immediately thinking, oh, I know what's coming next this tritone jump down to F, right? We, we like the linear nature ba -da -da, that the stepwise motion, the stepwise element of a passing tone gives us. So really, that's it. That's a passing tone. So if you find the space of a third, you can fill it in with a passing tone, must be completely stepwise and in the same direction. Now, of course, there are problems that could come up in certain circumstances, but Generally speaking, this is where you could try to put a passing tone. All right, let's look at the next one. Let's look at a neighbor tone. So neighboring motion we haven't talked about yet. Um, there's not, we haven't looked at a neighboring 6-4 or anything like that. Um, but neighboring tones are as straightforward as passing tones. So instead of filling in the space of a third, whether with a passing tone, downwards, upwards, doesn't matter, the neighboring tone or the neighbor tone elaborates on a repeated note. So if we look here, we're in E flat in this example. We were in E flat with an A natural there for some reason. Nice motion from one to five. And wouldn't you know it, our sopranos are kind of bored. Sopranos, you know, if you just give sopranos kind of the same note to sing too much, They'll find something more interesting to do. So you got to keep your sopranos kind of, got to keep them interested here. So we've got B flat, B flat. We've got a repeated note. And that means we can do a neighbor tone.
tone there. And what that's going to look like is that instead of just staying on the same note, we're going to go to the next note. We're going to go right to the neighboring note, the note that's right next door. And so instead of having this kind of thing, we've now got right, a lot more interesting. And that's, if we wanted to be real specific about this one, we could call this an upper neighbor tone. Because just like the passing tone, neighbor tones can go either upwards or downwards. The direction doesn't really matter. What matters is that it's elaborating on a repeated tone and that, again, it's completely stepwise, right? So both neighbor tones and passing tones are completely stepwise. The difference is that passing tones go all in the same direction, right? Passing tone, if it starts by moving upwards, it's going to continue upwards. Neighbor tone, it resolves back in the opposite direction. So what goes up must come back downwards, right? So that's a neighbor tone. So we said this is an upper neighbor tone. We could also do a quote unquote lower neighbor tone, right? This should, you should be able to sort of anticipate what's going to happen here. So if we're on this little three chord pattern, right in F, if we look at the altos this time, the altos are kind of just singing a whole bunch of F, and they might want something more interesting to do, right? And so I'm going to say, let's elaborate on the two Fs at the end there. And so if I put a lower neighbor tone, it's going to go completely stepwise, and it's going to go in between these two Fs. And so it's just going to go F to E, back up to F. And that's a lower neighbor tone. And listen to this. It's much more interesting. Hear that, that dissonance in there? Right? If I just play that on the beat, it's a beautifully clashy chord because look, while this E is happening, we've got F, D, and E all at once. D, E, F. That's the beauty of these. If you just sort of take them on their own, you end up with these really crunchy sounds. But in context, our ear is, is really able to figure out the motion where that dissonance is gonna go. And so we don't hear it so much as this vertical dissonance, we hear it as part of a horizontal line. That's one of the real beauties. Oops, that's one of the real beauties of these. And so that's what really what we're doing here. Passing tones and neighbor tones, again, they're both completely stepwise. So anything that you do that has a skip or a jump in it, not gonna fit the bill. But if we just look for passing tones to fill in the space of a third, upwards or downwards, and neighbor tones to elaborate on a repeated note, again, upwards or downwards, we can start to immediately add a lot of interest into uh, the musical texture that we are working on.